بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Hello and welcome dear viewers, ladies and gentlemen Dr. Muhammad Al-Shif, your host of Lexer of Life is kicking off another inspiring and informative episode with our distinguished guest to discuss very important topic today gonna discuss common pediatric emergency diseases besides that we have other inventive and stimulating segments stay tuned for a special episode <laughs> Once again, welcome back to Elixir of Life. We'll start with the first segment, gonna be quote of the week. To watch more details, stay with us. Don't go away. Once again, welcome back to Elixir of Life. Our next segment will be medical news. We'll be talking about annual continuing professional development forum to watch more details about this report. Stay with us. Good morning. My name is Naveen Faisal Aqili. I'm the supervisor on continuing medical education, King Faisal Specialist Hospital and Research Center. Uh, Miss uh, Naveen, what can you tell me about this uh, uh, event? Uh, this is a great event. First of all, I would like to thank King Fahad Medical City for the invitation they've done to us. Mr. Tariq al khwatim came to our uh, office and uh, gave us the brochure and the registration form. And I would like to thank Saudi Commission for the excellent information they are sharing and elaborating with us. Dr. Ayman Abdu was uh, taught us a lot of uh, uh, information that they are enhancing the online um, learning for Saudi Commission, the continuous uh, professional development. We are learning a lot from this event. We are sharing information, ex uh, exchanging uh, a lot of ideas. The uh, Saudi Commission for Health Specialists is, is a great institution sh sharing with us a lot of knowledge. For how long? This day is only uh, for this event is only for one day? Yes, it's for one day only. Yes. Um, so far, uh Tell us what you have gained or what you have learned from the lecture you just came from. We have learned about the, uh, the, the, the I learned that uh, Saudi Commission is uh, introducing now the, and they, are ha they have a lot of plan for uh, next year and they are going with the 2030 Saudi vision. Um, they, they really taught us a lot of uh, ideas, their plan they, are, uh, they want to establish in the coming years. Which we really, uh, everybody, the only constant in life is change. We are all, uh, we, we go with the change and we love the changes that Saudi Commission is going to do. And it's all for the, for the health provider. It's, it will go, give them more motivation. It will uh, make uh, exchanging the inv information easier between parties. Uh, last question, any last uh, thing you'd like to mention or advice? I would like to thank uh, everybody who uh, have um, uh, participated in uh, doing this great event from, Sa from King Fahd, Fahd Medical City to Saudi Commission uh, to, to Saudi Television, everybody, and uh, it's a great event. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, I'm Dr. Hanadi Bakda, uh, consultant of obstetric and gynecology, infertility and IVF, and advanced gynae laparoscopy in International Medical Center in Jordan. Welcome, Adas, Doctor. What can you tell me about this uh, day, this event? Okay, this uh, event it's an annual meeting uh, for the uh, continual uh, professional education for uh, uh, all the professional uh, in all over uh, the Saudi Arabia and. Uh, uh, the good thing about it that uh, we are meeting uh, uh, Dr. Uh, 
uh, I meant that uh, he's uh, the head of the uh, Saudi Society of uh, for Health uh, Association, and uh, in this annuals. Uh, uh, we have uh, all uh, the professionals or the ho all the it, uh, directors for the uh, C uh, continuing medical education all over the Saudi Arabia mainly. Once again, welcome back to Elixir of Life. Now we are coming to the most important segment. All we are waiting for, our episode theme, Common Pediatric Emergency Diseases. Pediatric emergency medicine is a medical subspecialty of pediatrics in emergency situations. It involves the care of unscheduled children with acute illnesses or injuries that require immediate medical attention. Pediatric emergency doctors undertake the necessary investigations to diagnose patients in the acute phase with serious illness and injury. To elaborate and to know more details about this uh, important topic, it's my honor and pleasure to uh, welcome uh, Dr. Amani Aziz Rahman, consultant pediatric emergency. Welcome, Dr. Amani. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, without further ado, uh, we'll start. Uh, you know uh, our uh, episode. We have quite interesting agenda, and I think we will start by the first question: What's the difference between pediatric and adult emergency physician? So, pediatric emergency physician is different than adult, being dealing only with children. Our background difference between uh, some of us is a pediatrician and then they got subspecialty of pediatric emergency and others they are adult emergency residency program and they go to pediatric emergency fellowship. So we deal basically more of pediatric emergency cases rather than dealing with adult. Uh, our pediatric scope of care is up to 14 in Saudi Arabia. Excellent. So the background could be, uh, I mean, pediatric uh, after adult. Yes. So it could be pediatric and then pediatric emergency fellowship, or it could be adult residency program and then pediatric emergency fellowship. So what's your background? My background is pediatric. So uh, pedi yeah, pediatric residency program. Is it advantageous over, you know? Well, it depends on the person, but most of the time uh, I see from my experience, if, if, if the person is a pediatrician, it's better to go for a pediatric emergency comparing with adult who choose to be a pediatric emergency f uh, physicians. It's just because they deal with pediatric uh, children for the last of four years, so they have known how to deal with them. Although some people are actually very expert in dealing with, with them, even though they didn't have uh, this luxury like us. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Dr. Amani. Our next question, what are the <laughs> common uh, pediatric emergency situation you face uh, in your clinical practice? Mm. So it depends on the seasons, but in general, they usually come with the trauma, and uh, which is basically more of house trauma regarding pediatric, mm. pediatric uh, patients, uh, which is falling down, fractures, suture. Uh, Beside fever, they come with fever illnesses and uh, mm -hmm. upper respiratory tract infection. Mm. Uh, in, s in case of uh, other seasons, which is related to which we're having now, like a winter, mm -hmm. <coughs> usually they come with more of upper respiratory tract infection. So it depends on the season. Yes, but commonly they have yeah. like more of trauma, uh, more of a fever. More trauma and fever. Yes. So it's our season in uh, September, which is like autumn. Okay. Yeah. Is it you know particular illnesses that you know the start of the winter? Okay. Yes, actually, we in the start of the winter, uh, autumn and winter, started of upper respiratory tract diseases, which is basically more of like asthma and uh, something called bronchitis, which is inflammation of the bronchial and bronchioles of that lung. And the other one, which is a croup, uh, which is basically upper respiratory obstruction, secondary to viral illnesses. Excellent. So we'll take it one uh, by one. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, uh, I mean, common pediatric emergency that affect the lungs uh, in kids uh, croup. Okay, can you t t give us more details yeah, about sure. croup? So croup is actually inflammation of uh, the trachea, which is the we call it uh, like a windpipe, and uh, when it's uh, have any inflammation, it become more smaller in size and narrow, and with this, because pediatric uh, trachea is actually very small. It's uh, it's like a smaller pinky finger, so it's very small. So like a finger, okay. the small one. So and with this inflammation, it become more smaller, and they will produce uh, sounds, which is they call it a croupy cough, uh, and uh, they're unable to breathe very well, 
and sometimes they present with the severe respiratory problems that they're able, unable to breathe. Sometimes they have uh, continuously coughing and sometimes they present with like blue discoloration in their, uh, around their mouth. So, uh, Doctor, uh, it's common in the winter, you mentioned? Yes, it's common in like in autumn and winter, so when, when the season starts to be cold, basically because it's the time where the viral illnesses start to increase. Yeah, so it's different from bronchitis and yes, you mentioned? Yes, it's different than bronchitis and asthma because bronchitis and asthma is actually lower, uh, lower airway tract infection and the croup is actually upper airway, so the treatment is different and the symptoms is different. Uh, the croup, they present more of a stridris, which is uh, strider, okay. a sounds, which is asthma, they present with a wheezy sound. Okay, so this is the, like for family, okay, or parents to distinguish that the uh, strange sound, okay, yes. you mentioned strider. Yeah, so a strider is like a, a sound which is like a whistle when coming and uh, it's very, uh, very um, distressing sounds usually to the family and usually they're complaining of that they're hearing their sounds when their child start to sleep or they breathe mm -hmm. or they're unable to breathe very well uh, and we advise them like if you have any abnormal sounds uh, just bring them to the hospital and then to, to take a medical checkup on them because it's uh, usually it's challenging to differentiate between both of them for the person who doesn't have a medical expertise. So uh, all patients with, uh, you know, respiratory tract infection uh, should come to emergency or there no. are, you know, uh, situations the that... Situation is depends. So like if they have looking well and they have only just runny nose and cough, they, they, they're drinking well, they don't have any other issues with the high fever or they don't look, look very sick, then probably they don't have to come to the ER. They can go to the primary health care clinic. Excellent. Okay. And, but if they have like abnormal sounds or they are looking very ill or if they have a high fever or they're unable to drink or eat, then probably emergency is the place. So what's the duration of the symptoms that should seek, you know, trigger them to seek, you know, uh, emergency uh, visit? Uh, it depends on the, uh, the disease and the symptoms, but mm. if like any time they notice that their child is not breathing very well or he's facing difficulty in taking uh, a bottle feed or even drinking juice or anything, then probably they have to come to the emergency. Excellent. Doctor, how can we uh, prevent the children having an accident at home? Mm. Well, uh, so it depends on the accidents. There's something which is uh, they commonly have when they fall down. So the home should be a place which is the children able to run and jump without having any uh, things which is may affect them uh, or lead to a trauma, such as like uh, glasses or table which is made of glass or sharp edges of the tables or the chairs. Because m you commonly they come banging their, uh, with trauma in their mouth or their face because they ha hit their head in the table because they're younger or shorter, especially mm -hmm. when they're trying to walk. Uh, the others, uh, like any sharp object, should be kept away. Uh, knife or forks or any screwdrivers or anything should be kept away because sometimes they, they, they're they try to explore things, so they try to play with those things, so they may injure themselves while they're doing those uh, in, in these situations. Excellent. So is there any measures, you know, uh, to prevent, like you mentioned that, to avoid, you know, sharp you know, uh, objects, okay, or table with a sharp edge. Is there any measures that they put some, you know, rubber, okay, or plastic, yeah, okay? Yeah, there's in multiple, in like in uh, commercial things that you can uh, put it in uh, to cover the edges of the tables. And also like, because sometimes they put their heads in the, in the, t in the toilet, so to cover the toilet to prevent them from opening and then they're able to, because their head is bigger. So if they, they usually try to look to see what is inside in the water and they may fall down. So there is a commercial thing that uh, you can find it in the market or the parents can find it uh, to prevent those uh, dangerous And situations. you recommend for it? Do you recommend? Well, usually we recommend that uh, children should not be attended alone, should be with their parents and uh, or, or, or the caregiver. And those sharp objects, like uh, the one which is for to cover the sharp objective, is, is very good and uh, it's advisable to use it. Actually, we use it at home. Oh, that one good. you mentioned, okay. My wife bought it, okay, and we use that the cover the sharp edges of the table. Yeah. Uh, the other question, the other common, you know, emergency uh, situation at home, the ingestion of foreign uh, body or choking. Yeah. Uh, so could you talk about this and how to, would you demonstrate for us how sure. to, you know, deal with a choking child, okay? Yeah. Mm. So uh, it's actually two things, either they choke with it or either they take something which Excellent. is not supposed to, uh, supposed to take it. If they chalk, usually children around the age of exploration up to from six months from six months to four years, they try to put something in their mouth just to see what is it. 
and uh, usually when they put those things in the mouth sometimes it's obstruct uh, the trachea and they're unable to breathe very well mm -hmm. so if they are conscious and aware then we advise the family also always and uh, to do to take a CPR courses which is teach them how to deal with the situation when their children are unable to breathe or they have any situation like uh, choking or even drowning or even like un unresponsive so if we said if we took an infant let's say he's a six month and he took something in his mouth so before you proceed doctora so you recommend the CPR courses not yes. only for healthcare professional yes. even public yes so there is a couple of places which they provide the CPR for uh, for teachers for uh, parents, for anybody who's willing to do. It's different than the one that for healthcare professional or modified. It's the same or thing, it's just only with Arabic and it's all modified and s simplified rather than the one we do it Excellent. in medical, right. uh, uh, medical care. Excellent. So, if we just let's say if it depends if the child is conscious or unconscious, but let's say that the child is conscious. So, to, to check the conscious that uh, how he's aware, so you have to shake him, just make sure that he is he's, he's coughing or he's. Uh, uh, distress or if there is something uh, around his mouth or sh her mouth in this case because sh she looked like a female like a blue discoloration we advise them that to to support uh, their head uh, by holding their the thumb and the index finger around uh, the face mm -hmm. and then try to put their hand in, in their knees just to support uh, mm -hmm. to support uh, the hand and push it downwards like this mm -hmm. and they give five blow so one two three four five mm -hmm. and then after that, they turn it around and do see the nipple line and go beneath the nipple line and give five thrusts. So one, two, three, four, five. And it should be like this, like bend, uh, rest it in your knees. It's easier for the support because mm -hmm. you don't want the child to fall down. And when you do this, you observe if there is something coming out. If there is nothing coming out, then you go back again to do it, which is you turn it around like this, support your hand in the feet, support your hand uh, on your thigh, and just do one, two, three, four, five and then back again to put the turn on and do one, two, three, four, five again. And usually the object will come out. Can you again demonstrate because this is important for all, you know, parents, especially mothers. Okay, let's say how they, uh, I mean, uh, we, we can demonstrate again later on, but sure. how we, you know, uh, find out, let's say uh, the mother did not witness the child that, you know, uh, swallowed, you know, a front body, how she can recognize that this is, uh, I mean, signs, or symptoms of a uh, foreign uh, body, okay? Mm. Which is a very important thing because sometimes it doesn't, usually family doesn't notice this. Uh, it depends on the situation. If his, if the child was playing around and there was a small objective, object that they were playing with or even in the floor, so usually we ask the family, did you notice that he was playing with something which is very small that he may able to swallow? Uh, commonly they do it with foods, small, small food particles like uh, beans or um, or even small toys, uh, or the Coins. pedals and the um, uh, the pedals uh, that uh, some people carry on. So he'd take his father's and then play with it, and he break it down and try to play with those things, or even like put it in their mouth. Uh, coins can happen also as well. Uh, so they usually come with abnormal, same thing with the one which is upper respiratory in general. They will come unable to breathe very well, have any abnormal sounds, stridors and uh, sometimes like continuously coughing and uh, sometimes they present also with a blue discoloration around their mouth excellent uh, great uh, doctor do you have any you know uh, because now we have wide you know separate uh, use of spinner have you uh, i mean we heard in the media that uh, some kids okay they ingested uh, part of the spinner okay mm -hmm. have you I mean, uh, we encountered such uh, situation. We yeah. haven't had any cases in our hospital, but yes, I have read like in many articles that people sometimes put their spinner in their mouth and they may choke with it. And in those cases, usually they have to go to the emergency because it's stick in their uh, uh, airway or even their esophagus and have to be removed. Okay, so that's true. It's not yes. uh, it's, 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 it's a fact. Okay, and uh, Dr. Amani, uh, if the let's say a child was choking, that was you know uh, resuscitated at home or uh, versus a child that who is coming to the emergency station by i mean what the maneuver you did what the out difference in the outcome okay have you seen like case from your uh, you know extensive experience so okay? usually they come and they're usually fine so we do we, we do the same thing if they are conscious that the key is if he's able to breathe or he's unable to breathe mm. if he's conscious and he's trying to breathe so he's coughing or he's producing abnormal sounds that's and he's not losing his conscious so he's aware uh, meaning that he is 
crying, he's moving his upper limb, he's moving his lower limb. So usually we do the same maneuver. If not, then if they're unconscious, we do. We turn to do uh, CPR because we, we don't want them to lose their life. So we have to provide their, their body with oxygen and with uh, uh, their body with blood. So we change it rather than doing just only the five back blow and uh, thrust to CPR. What do you think the level of awareness for our public about such, you know, procedures? Because the mother will panic. The first yes. thing that she will panic, I mean, what do you think the, the bar, okay, is it really how we compare to the international? Hmm. So internationally, they actually take those uh, CPR lessons. It's, it's actually mandatory to anybody who's driving and anybody who's uh, dealing with children, like in the school or in, any, in a swimming pool or anywhere that they may, those incidents may occur. Uh, we don't have those, uh, but definitely in the future, those things are going to increase uh, being uh, that people start to be more aware of those situations. And also, like everybody's uh, from the medical field, trying to increase the awareness of the, those things that CPR should be uh, teached in the hospitals uh, for non-healthcare uh, provider to minimize those situations because those are actually a life-saving things. Five minutes is make a difference in pediatrics. Absolutely, that's very important. What age you, uh, you know, set so maneuver done? So this is for infants. We do it for the up infants. To? Uh, which is up basically up to one to two years. After years two huh? two, then, like after two years, then we have to do something else. What other maneuver? I mean, more than two years, what else, okay? I mean, so we do the helmic maneuver. What's helmic uh, maneuver? Which is like the adult one. Mm -hmm. uh, Usually, okay. We usually, we just put uh, like uh, it's the same thing that you put a hand, a fist uh, around uh, after the symphysis pubis and try to blow, push it up to make the to expel those uh, uh, foreign body from their mouth. And uh, usually, those things, same thing. The child should be conscious, uh, not uh, unconscious. So you can ask them like, are you awake? Are you aware what happened? D are you choking? Do you have something in your mouth? If they answer yes, then probably they are conscious. If not, then you have to do uh, CPR for them. Because if they're unconscious, same thing with the infant, you want to provide them with the oxygen air to their body. Thank you, Dr. Amani. Uh, now coming to the next question, what are the, besides what you have mentioned, what are the most common cases of emergency you deal with in the hospital? So it depends on the place you're working uh, at. In my hospital, because we are a tertiary hospital and we do see cases related to, depends on the, our scope of care. So we see more of oncology emergency, which oncology. is uh, cancers and uh, um, leukemia and others emergencies. And we see uh, metabolic diseases, which is the any genetic diseases they came to our hospital. Beside mm. uh, the other who's following up with uh, secondary to GI tract uh, diseases and others, beside those things, which is the trauma and uh, upper respiratory tract infection, who's severely ill and need uh, emergency to come to. And foreign body. And, and a foreign body, yes. Etc. And what are, uh, Doctor, how do you deal with uh, a minor uh, parent? Because parent, again, is a common among, you know, uh, pediatrics. Yes. Yeah. So uh, it depends on the burn uh, and depends on where is it. So because, like, uh, if it's the burn and pediatric, if it's the hand or feet or something, uh, like, in the face, so they actually need uh, very high specify uh, hospitals with a burn center. Burn center. Uh, so basically, we do we 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 do the first uh, initial thing to just stabilize them and then ask them uh, to go to other hospitals, which is they have high specialist plastic and burn units, burn units such yes. as uh, King Khalid University or uh, Shemesi Hospital. Yes, King yes, Saud King Saud Medical City. Yes. Yeah, because they are they have a burn center. Uh, mm. which is uh, which is usually those cases need this but if it's just only minor uh, we advise the family to not to put ice on it because that's what commonly people do so mm. not to put so ice wrong on practice it. ice yes. yeah so uh, ice is not recommended because the area is actually very fragile so when you put ice it's m became more uh, irritating to the skin more so it damaged it more so what we advise them that you have to put it under running water for at least 15 minutes running like water. you do a running water you don't mm. have to uh, tap water you don't have to make it very cold or very hot it's just only a regular tap water 15 minutes and uh, to bring them to the hospital mm. what we do in those cases we just make sure that clean is the wound is clean there is no other involvement other injuries because sometimes they, they burn including other injuries if they like uh, a hot cup fall down on them, then probably we just want to make sure they don't have also a fracture in their bone. Oh, great. And then if there's nothing, then we just apply uh, a dressing, clean it up and apply a dressing and advise the family to do that daily or every other day. It depends on the situation. There are some special, you know, plasters, okay, that used for burn. 
Uh, there is a special plaster which is uh, contains silver nitrate because it, uh, evidence found it's effective. But even if it's not available, you can use like a regular dressing. You don't have to use uh, like the silver nitrate. Okay, yes. It's all, it's all, uh, it's all of them is effective actually. Yeah, because this is, I mean, leading us. Is there any, you know, that some, you know, uh, tools that should uh, be, you know, available at home in what we call emergency kit? Mm. Uh, yes, actually, we advise the family to have uh, emergency kit at home, which contain the basic things, basics uh, like uh, band aid, uh, gauze, uh, cotton, alcohol swab, uh, also like um, disinfectant, uh. disinfectant, uh, yeah, just as, uh, disinfected alcohol swab and disinfected, and also like if they have something uh, to rub their hands or f uh, or, f or hands or foot or uh, ankles, if they have any uh, sign of trauma or bleeding. Uh, because we don't advise to put anything inside the wound. So we want the family just to cover it and come to the hospital. We'll talk about the wound, okay, more. Because you brought up uh, the, the wound, okay. Uh, how you deal with uh, a cut? Uh, how do we clean a uh, wound, as you mentioned? Can you just more details about this? Yeah, sure. Mm. So in, in case of any cut wound or injuries, regardless what is the cause which lead to it, either like if it's uh, a sharp objective or like they fall down and they have small scratches or anything, what we advise the parents to do is just make sure that they don't they don't have too much bleeding, and if the, either way we want them to clean it very well with the normal saline uh, with water, and then not to put anything uh, anything inside the wound because sometimes people tend to put coffee, yes, beans or they salt. put uh, salt or anything, and the problem with those things because people do it they think if they put those stuff it actually stop the bleeding. And uh, in, uh, what would happen, it's actually harm the wound more because those mm -hmm. are all foreign body. And uh, when it's difficult to clean it out from their wounds and it's lead to more of possible of infection. So what we always advise them just to cover the wound with a gauze and wrap it. And this is will hold the bleeding. And usually the blood, uh, the blood in the body and the wound at, as well, it try to, um, I would say correct itself or heal itself by itself. So they will try the same vessels that will try to minimize the amount of blood coming out and uh, the wound itself will try to heal itself by producing substance and material. So those are the safe thing to do rather than putting any coffee beans or I don't know, some people put They uh, put uh, her uh, herbal, herbal, herbs, herbal medications, yeah. traditional uh, therapy. Yeah. So we want to just send a clear message. What are the cut wounds that, you know, should, you know, trigger the parents to bring their child to uh, emergency rather than keeping at home, apply some dressing and say that might, you know, uh, spontaneous, okay? Uh, like vital organs uh, or vital, you know, uh, areas, face, okay? Yeah. Mm. So mm. any cut wound which lead to, which is deep, look deep to them, like not, not scratches, then probably it's an indication to come to the emergency. So this is one, so like a okay. deep wound. Okay. Or if like they have injuries secondary to, let's say he fall down and he closed the door in his finger and they can see like it's it's already moved out from its place or Excellent. mobilized. Excellent, that's very important. Mm -hmm. And uh, if they have like uh, any injuries which is lead to excessive bleeding, uh, so the blood is not able to be stopped, then probably it's also an indication to come to them to the emergency. What about the face? Because this is very cosmetic, you know. Mm. Yeah. So any injuries in the it depends on the place. Uh, sometimes we advise them to come to the emergency, but sometimes we don't do anything. Uh, and if it's in the tongue laceration or if like in the lip laceration, and uh, because it may heal very fast, we advise them to come to just seek a medical advice because, as you mentioned, it's a cosmetic place. Uh, we do sometimes use a glue, which is a medi medical glue. It's not glue which is in the market. It's a medical glue. It depends on the wound, how does it look like. Mm, so this is yeah. very if interesting. It's, like, uh, like a, it's, it's, uh, it's more of like closure of the wound rather than dressing. It's a new modality? Uh, it's uh, not that new, new but mm. it's a relatively new, yes. So sure. just close the wound. Uh, without uh, sutures. Without suturing, yes. It depends on the place, but it has its own indication and contraindication to use it. But uh, if it's like, say, uh, the wound is uh, small and it uh, doesn't lead to active bleeding, then probably we use the glue. Excellent. Uh, Dr. Amani, I think we will come to a very important question. What are the most commonly uh, abused toxic, you know, materials at home by uh, kids? Yeah. So home has many places which is have, which is children can play in and can lead to uh, toxic ingestion. Uh, we can divide it into two, uh, two categories. The first one, which is household material, such okay. as uh, 
cleaning detergents or uh, if you something which is used to kill the rats or others or medication excellent so three okay yeah. categories I think we have to pause for a report sure. we will uh, gonna go for a report uh, to watch more details about this report please stay with us thank you how to know when to take a baby to the emergency room are you overreacting to a minor illness or injury or does your baby need immediate medical attention these guidelines will help you decide you will need a baby thermometer monitoring of symptoms and your local poison control number step one if your baby is having difficulty breathing is breathing noisily or has a blue tinge to their skin call 911 lift your baby's shirt if they're using their stomach or neck muscles to breathe it's an emergency step two take their temperature if a baby three months old or younger has a fever of 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit or more and is unresponsive or sluggish go to the ER immediately for a baby older than three months take them if their fever is above 105 degrees and they aren't responding normally step three if a baby is crying inconsolably or cries even harder when you pick them up get immediate help step four Go to the ER if your baby's vomit is bloody or green, or has been throwing up longer than 24 hours. If it's an infant less than 6 months old, take them to the ER if they're vomiting forcefully, no matter what. If your baby has been vomiting and has diarrhea, pay attention to their urine output. If it's much less than usual, they may be dangerously dehydrated. Step 5. Know the difference between a baby who is tired and cranky due to a garden variety illness, and one who is dangerously ill. Signs of the latter include extreme lethargy, a baby who cannot be roused, and one who shows confusion. Step 6. Call your doctor if your baby falls from a height of 2 feet or more, even if they show no sign of being injured. Call 911 if they are unresponsive, have a seizure, have blood or clear fluid leaking from their ears or nose, have bruising around the eyes or behind the ears, or become lethargic. If an infant under 2 months old has a bruise on their head or swelling, it may indicate child abuse. Step 7. Get emergency help if your baby gets a chemical burn, an electrical burn, or a second-degree burn which is evidenced by blistering. Call 911 for any burn larger than the baby's hand. Step 8. If you suspect your baby ingested poison or adult medication, call your local poison control center. They will instruct you as to whether you should call 911 or take your baby to the hospital. Did you know? The majority of pediatric emergency room visits are for non-urgent conditions, according to one study. Once again, welcome back to Elixir of Life. It's my great pleasure and honor to welcome my guest, Dr. Amani Aziz Rahman. And our episode theme, we're talking about common pediatric emergency diseases. We posed on very important uh, question that what are the most commonly abused toxic materials? And you have mentioned that a household cleaning detergent, uh, rat or uh, poison, pesticide, and medications. Could you elaborate more on this? Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, it depends on the material. You do it with children, or uh, because they uh, try to expose and to discover things, and uh, it's a practice for the either the, the mothers or an, the one who's cleaning the house to put all those material in the regular bottles, uh, water bottles. So for them, they think that this is a water, so they try to drink it. Mm -hmm. And uh, it depends on the material which is they ingested. Some some of them can lead to burn their esophagus and lead to long time injuries corrosive and some material, of them no? uh, corrosive material yes and some of them doesn't do anything uh, so what we advise the family if those situation happened to call uh, 937 which is the saudi connection for the from the ministry of health mm -hmm. and uh, discuss with them that whatever they took and they will guide them to go to the emergency or those material is not hazard, so they don't have to worry about Excellent. This is a poison control center. It's actually Saudi ca Saudi Ministry of Health uh, number. Okay. They, they contain everything like poison centers or others. So they mm. just uh, call this number. It's a generalized symbol, one number. And they can di direct uh, to the poison control of the Saudi Arabia. Excellent. So that's very important. Initial, you know, a step you mentioned. Uh, so what other steps, okay, uh, you should uh, be taking at home before, you know, arriving to hospital? Yes. So we advise them not to bring, to drink anything because uh, what they found in the manufacturers to give the child milk or uh, juice or anything. 
And the problem with that, because if they don't know what is the material and it can be corrosive, as you mentioned. So if it's corrosive, then probably it may, again, lead to irritation their esophagus again. So we don't recommend them to do more anything. More damage to the cause. It, it can lead to more damage because it when it go down, it can lead to a damage. And then whenever they vomit or gag, it can lead to another damage. Mm. So we don't recommend them to drink milk or juice anything or to well, prior Because to uh, milk commonly used for yes. uh, chlorex, OK? Yes, it's actually. Is it a myth or a uh, fact? No. It's actually it's written in the manufacturer that you have to to give the, your child the juice or milk or anything, and it doesn't have any evidence ba uh, evidence based uh, ground behind it. So we don't recommend them to do anything. And uh, chlorix is by itself, it doesn't have to any lead to any problem. So it's, it's not a hazard. Harm, yeah, it's uh, not. It's self limiting. Uh, it's actually because the chloric, uh, the amount of chlorine, is, it's very minimum in it. But because we don't know what type of chlorix, some people bring it. They say chlorix, but actually they bring it from the manufacturer, which is very concentrated. So we always uh, ask them to bring it to the hospital, and then we'll see what we do. Excellent. If they Great need anything point. or not. Okay. No. Yes. And uh, other steps that should be taken? Uh, for the household material, it depends on what is it. Sometimes, uh, like if they took a soap or if they took uh, like a cleaning uh, areas, cleaning things, which is doesn't have any hazard thing, we we reassure the family and then they don't have to do anything. And regarding the corrosive, then we actually have to call a specialized uh, subspecialty, which is the gastroenterologist. They deal with the with the GI mm -hmm. tract which is the esophagus and the stomach, they have to do scope to see how bad is this. So they have to take a picture from there inside the esophagus to see how bad is the burn and then advise the family. It depends on the, how bad is it. Excellent. What are the most common uh, corrosive you know, materials? Uh? So uh, DAC is one of the things because it contains hydro hydroxide uh, chloride. So, so it's DAC, OK. This is a clean uh, okay, detergent, OK? Yep. So this is more, okay. The other thing, the so the the one the the, the newly com newly commercial uh, house uh, newly commercial sh um, machine washer, machine washer, uh, which is the not the powder one. It's the one which is contained, which is in the. Mm. Uh, it's like a small bubbles or something that you put in the machine. It's very it's very dangerous for children. Very dangerous. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, what are you know the steps to undertake for you know. Uh, rat poison or uh, let's take it one by one the rat poison okay because this is uh, it look like uh, sweet yeah. it's uh, it's a poison that look like you know candy yeah mm -hmm. it's actually like uh, it's uh, as you mentioned it's like a candy it's it contain it colors it red or purple and people like they put it in their floor around the edges uh, to kill the rat and the problem with those things we don't know how much they ingest so mm -hmm. it can lead to bleeding tendency so it's uh, the thing that we advise the family if they notice their child took those material to, to, to come to the hospital immediately. And uh, if it causes bleeding, you know, uh, have you seen cases? Is it a common or? It's not that common, but it's one of the emer which is high top emergency because you don't know what happened. And actually the half life of this medication is five days. Okay. So it can happen at any time. Usually not the first day, but it can happen afterwards. Because we give them the antidote as like uh, fresh frozen plasma it or vitamin K. It depends on the case, hmm? but it depends on the case. Uh, it depends on the we do tests and investigation. And you uh, and in my hospital we have a uh, poison uh, control center. toxicology hmm. on call, and we depend it depends on whether his advice or her advice. Okay, so that's uh, come on. Uh, what about uh, I mean. Uh, Insecticide uh, or pesticide, because this is a common, again, yeah. commonly abused by children, and we hear about deaths, you know, related to that one. Okay. Yes, mm. uh, it's one of the thing that people use it in periphery of the cities, or sometimes even in the cities, because uh, they use it to kill the lice or to lice in in, ca at ca in camel oh, or even in common, the skin. Okay. So, so uh, they try to wash it. Uh, they 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 either the children try to drink it, or actually the the parents wash their children who has a lice with those material. And the problem with those material, they can be go to their body, inside their body, by either through the skin or either through inhalation or either through uh, like drinking. And it uh, can lead to lethal thing. As you mentioned, they can die from it. So it's one of the things that lead to, that they have to come immediately to the hospital to, uh, to see a physician. And usually we take a full precaution because even if we touch the child, it can transmit it to us, the, the mm -hmm. material, and it can lead to a hazard. So recommend them to take off their clothes, okay? Yes, we, we, we advise the family to take their clothes and actually we do decontamination to them when they come. So we wash them very well to make sure that they don't have any remnant of their material in their skin or their clothes. 
uh, and then we try if depends on how bad they look like and their vital signs and uh, their condition uh, most of the time we ad we admit them to the critical care unit ICU because uh, most of the time they need observation for a long time of period six or twelve hours or so even more like so what are toxic material organophosphate or yes, organophosphate because here about phosphine or yeah. other so organophosphate which is commonly people call it al jarrah uh, and the manufacturer think that yes, it contain uh, it's one of the material which can lead to those things. Excellent. Uh, what about the most commonly, uh, as you mentioned, that medications yeah. that abused by children? What are the most common uh, medications in, from your you know daily clinical practice? So from my daily pr clinical practice, the children uh, because they try to expose and see. Usually, it's adult medication actually. So the antihypertensive medication, the uh, the anti. Uh, uh, antilipid medication or even like sometimes by mistake parents give them ro wrong dose of paracetamol mm -hmm. so that's what you usually come to the ED with so these are the common so the top one uh, that you need to be aware okay like the parent okay how to deal with mm. uh, so what we advise to the, the family uh, that if ch your child took any medication uh, to call 137 or to bring them to the hospital immediately because it depends on their tablets, it depends on the content of the tablets, it depends how long uh, they took it time-wise and how much they took it uh, amount-wise, uh, the treatment will be different. So we ask them actually to come immediately to emergency in any of those cases. Mm -hmm. The thing that is not a top emergency and people tend to come for it is oral contraceptive pills. Okay. It doesn't really lead to any problem, so they don't have to come to the emergency for those uh, medication. Excellent. Uh, oral contraceptive pills. It's a common thing, which is people come running and afraid that their child, uh, they may ha it may harm them. Excellent, because for us as adults, the most commonly abused medication is paracetamol. Is it common in uh, kids? Yes, an adult. Uh, it's common in pediatric as well. So in adults or even teens, they may took it if they want to attempt suicide Suicidal or by attempt. mistakes. Uh, for pediatric, it's not that common to have a paracetamol unless it was handy to the children. So they were playing and they drink it. They tend don't not to like the, the taste, but uh, some pe some children they do like to take it, taste it. So this is one of the things that come to the emergency. Or if the, the the mom or the father or the, the caregiver uh, forgot that they gave him the dose, so they gave him multiple doses, or the dose was not advised by uh, a physician, so the dose were high, uh, so sometimes they come with those things as well. Excellent, because now they use uh, flavored okay, uh, yeah. paracetamol, so it might be liked by the kid. So yeah. you, if used for suicidal attempt, uh, I mean, what should parent they do? Because as I know that it's asymptomatic, does not cause symptoms at the initial phase, and the uh, symptoms of toxicity can appear, you know, later on. What yeah. should be done? Okay, what so do you advise? We advise them to bring them to the hospital, and then we'll give them something to drink to, to minimize the amount of the toxic which go to their blood. Antidote. Huh? And uh, it's a, it's a, um, it's a charcoal, so charcoal, they have to okay. drink it, uh, and then which is it will hold the toxin and then try to get rid from it from the body. Okay. And uh, the other thing, if it's toxic material, if the level is, we do investigation to see how bad is it, how high is the medication in their body. If it's high, then probably we'll give them, as you mentioned, the antidote. Excellent. So, we, so the measures that you use, that you give charcoal to prevent absorption or adsorption. Yes. Of, uh, it's not only for paracetamol, also for other medication. What the time frame that we can administer charcoal after so ingestion of the, let's say, the poisonous material or? Uh, Again, it depends on the material, but we prefer to give it in the first one hour. First in general. One hour. Yeah, but some material we tend to give it repeatedly. It depends on their absorption, but in general, I would say like it should be better to be given the first one hour of the ingestion. So it lose the value after uh, one hour? Hmm. It decreases the value. Decrease the value. Yeah. What about other, I will say, old measures? Is it still used to induce uh, vomiting by epicac or use uh, gastric lavage, and etc.? Uh, hmm. Epicac is not uh, used anymore. Huh? Used before, but there is a new study that they may say that it may have the rule in different, it depends on the tablets. Uh, well, most of the studies were done in Japan or others that they advise to give uh, epicac. And regarding scope, sometimes we do have to do a scope, uh, especially in tablets like the iron tablet because it's stuck and it's uh, like it make a bulk inside the stomach. So if it's uh, if it's too many and uh, unable to get rid of it, then probably scoping and take it out is uh, advisable because it may release their toxin inside their body. 
Excellent. Now for iron, do we do just X-ray or uh, I mean like because it's radio opaque or not? It is radio opaque, so we do an abdominal X-ray to see how is it. If it's tablet, if it's syrup, we c we are able to detect it. Just only if it's tablets. Excellent. Uh, Dr. Amani, uh, we are moving to another important uh, question. Mm -hmm. How to deal with a drowning uh, child at uh, home? Because this is a very common and unfortunately we hear a lot of accident at home, uh, you know, with a child with a drowning, okay? Yeah. How to prevent and how to deal with it? Again, it starts with the prevention. So not to leave the child unattended in case of uh, he was playing in the place which is they have a swimming pool. And uh, the swimming pool should have a fence around it to prevent children to go into the swimming pool. Uh, the other thing that if they are playing, if they don't know how to swim, they're probably any lifeguard thing uh, to wear it because those things which minimize the possibility of drowning in the, uh, to pr just to minimize the incidents to happen. Uh, if those happen, then probably they should take the child out of the swimming pool mm -hmm. and try to check if they're uh, responsive or not responsive. If they're not responsive, then they have to start the CPR early on. And that's why I said early on that we recommend the, the parents or anybody who's dealing with children to take a CPR lessons mm -hmm. because it's a life-saving thing. I think if we have time later on at the end, we, we can demonstrate okay, yes, how sir. to perform uh, CPR, okay? Uh, so if the patient is, if the child is unconscious, so CPR, CPR should be CPR and the first thing, they uh, so after they start the CPR, they have to call the ambulance to come early on. Uh, because we, they need to transfer the patient immediately to the emergency room. What about the pressure on the abdomen to, you know, push the water? Is it is a right practice or this is... Uh, it's not a medically recommended because if they do this, then probably they will vomit and aspirate. So mm -hmm. the, the, the old, uh, uh, the water material that they wear in the swimming, at, at the swimming pool, it will come and they will aspirate with it and it go to their lung. So it's not recommended to do any pushing in their stomach. To get Ex the fluid out. Excellent, Doctor. Now, uh, recently, as you mentioned, there is it's a subspecialty of emergency, you know, medicine that you have toxicologist. Yes. So, is it uh, toxicology for toxicologist, adult or pediatric? Okay. And uh, boys in control center. Boys, yeah. Can you talk about you know, shed some light about this? So uh, it depends. Uh, so it's actually subspecialty of uh, emergency. So some of the people, as, as pediatric emergency, as a subspecialty of emergency or pediatric, some of the physician, they finish their uh, adult emergency practice, or they call emergency residency program. Mm -hmm. So after they finish their emer emergency residency program, they take a toxicology as subspecialty. Or uh, people who finish uh, like pediatric residency, then go pediatric emergency, then they take a toxicology. It's all, uh, some pharmacists also take a fellowship in toxicology and they, uh, they can be like uh, dealing with the toxicology cases. Our head of the Department of Toxicology is actually a pharmacist who did uh, this. Excellent, very beautiful. Uh, I think uh, we'll move to another important question, which is a common uh, febrile uh, kid or febrile child, and sometimes febrile with a convulsion, okay? Yeah. How to deal with such, you know, scenario, okay? So febrile convulsion, it's one of the common disease we it come to children who have a family history of febrile convulsion. So if the, fa if the child doesn't have any positive family history for bread convulsion, because people sometimes they hear the word and they think that everybody, they may have a febrile convulsion. So it's actually come to children who have a family history. The, don't, the, so the children who doesn't have family history, they don't have a risk of po or possibility to have this febrile convulsion. If they have a convulsion with the fever, then pop, uh, it could be something else rather than a febrile convulsion. But febrile convulsion per se, it's a uh, child who come, who have a fever, and it, uh, the fever doesn't have to be high grade fever. It depends on the child system. So some of them they have a, with a low grade fever, and they start to shiver and they have abnormal movement. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not as scary. It's, it looks scary, and we totally understand if the family freaking out. But it doesn't lead to anything to their brain. So it's one of the diseases that uh, doesn't have any impact in their brain function. Usually they're living very well, and we don't tend to give them treatment for lifelong. But we advise the family that if this happened, they have to take care not to min uh, affect their airway. So we usually advise them to put in recovery position. Oh, we can do the sure. recovery position. So if they have any abnormal movement, they have to put the child in, a, in, a, in a, like a firm surface, like a floor or uh, a table. 
uh, preferably the floor, not, not at the, the bed. bed. Uh, not the bed. Not the okay. bed. Not at the at the lap of the mom or anybody or anywhere else. It should be like a firm place. And then they have to put them in in the lateral position. Push uh, push the hand like this and uh, put it, put it put his body like this and try to move his neck in this way and try to support his his airway. his mm -hmm. airway yeah so the idea of this because with this movement they may vomit and if they're lying down they vomit the vomit may go to their lung and they may aspirate but if you put it in this way the vomit will fall down in, in the floor or in the mat and like in the surf uh, the hard surface rather than going to their lung and you have to and when, when you open their airway just to make sure they're breathing because sometimes they may clench their mouth or they may close their mouth so just you want to make sure that their mouth is uh, if they're, they're actually breathing rather than not breathing and call if they are if this has happened for more than five ten minutes then call the em the emergency ems because they may have to bring him to the hospital and so more than five treatment. minutes is the usually it lasts for 15 minutes like the the cut limit is 15 minutes for the febrile convulsion but because we don't know waste time regarding bringing the ambulance and take long time in the transportation is very crowded or anything so we advise them like after five minutes if not stop call the call the ambulance excellent thank you dr amani uh, what are the take-home messages from such important and informative interview would like to give to our you know, sure. your viewers? I would say like anybody who dealing with children, uh, parents or school or anywhere, that they have to take a CPR lessons. And uh, the other thing is keep the, all the medications uh, in a cabinet, in a closed cabinet at home. Don't keep it in a place which is children able to reach. Uh, and if you have any concern regarding your child, what's happening or anything, you can call 937. They're happy to answer all the questions. Excellent. And to, you know, don't leave the child unattended. That's a, exactly. a very important message, whether it's swimming pool or foreign bodies. Yeah. I think this is kind of uh, negligence. With that, uh, we will conclude. I would like, you know, thank you uh, and really appreciate you, uh, your presence with us. Thank you. you enlightened us about very important topic for all. Uh, parents how to deal with the pediatric you know emergency uh, and I wish to see you again our program Inshallah. thank you Dr. Amanda thank okay. you welcome. now we are coming to the last segment of our program we'll go for a report health benefits uh, thank you Dr. Amani and we will go for uh, now we will conclude uh, our program before we uh, conclude I would like thank our uh, team uh, and I thank also the audience uh, for viewing our episode. We wish, uh, okay, it was useful and informative. Until next week, we wish you a pleasant week ahead. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Goodbye.